Every function you've ever written has had a stack. Well, not, not this, hold on. Oh. But what is a stack? What does it do for your program? Why does each function have their own? How does it work under the hood? Also, why am I stuck here in Windows XP? I don't know, I, I'm just as lost in this premise as you are. I got banished here when I coded in Haskell and I have, I've kind of just been floating around here. Let's go back to the VM. So here I have a very basic C program that we're going to use to kind of show what the stack does for each program, what a stack frame is, and how essentially a stack frame is used to store local data. Here we have the function main. This is the default function in C that always gets called. And by default, any function that you say that isn't a naked function, which is, you know, the default attribute is not naked, uh, it will create its own stack frame. What does a stack frame do? It creates room for local variables like this function, like this variable Z here. Now, when I call function foo, the assembly instructions under the hood are going to create a new stack frame for foo to create room for these local variables. We're gonna actually disassemble this program and we're gonna walk step by step through the assembly to talk about how a new stack frame is created. But before we do that, we first need to understand some basic things about CPUs to understand what's going on in the creation of a stack frame. When we talk about assembly in any context, we need to understand that inside the CPU, there are these hyper fast variables that are called registers. Now, some of them are GP or general purpose registers where they can contain any kind of data. One of them is extended BX, EBX, right? We can put any data in there that we want to. It really serves no purpose to the CPU other than general purpose. Now, there are others that are special purpose registers. One of them, for example, is ESP, the extended stack pointer. What that does is that points to the top of our stack frame. We'll talk about what that actually means here in a second. And another one is EBP. This points to the bottom of our stack frame, right? So B being the bottom and S being the top. Now, when we talk about addresses, this is a bit of a holy war in like the computer architecture space. But when we talk about the stack, we can picture a stack of plates, right? So here is the top of our stack of plates. And, you know, typically SP will point here. When we push additional variables onto our stack of plates, SP will go up because the top of our stack gets higher as we push additional plates higher and higher onto the stack. Now, it is important to understand that as SP goes up, the value becomes more negative. The more negative SP is, the taller our stack is. I know it's a little bit of a weird nuance in the world of computing, but just understand when we push SP goes up, meaning SP goes negative. Our stack grows up negatively. And all the while SP is going up in this case, we have BP here, which is keeping track of the bottom of our stack frame. I keep throwing around these words stack frames. So let's talk about what a stack frame actually is. In our example there before, I showed you that we had a function main and the function main called a function foo. Before function main actually called foo, it already had a stack frame established. So you can kind of picture it like this, where we have two arrows that point to the top and the bottom of the stack, right? This thing here is referred to as main stack Stack frame and main stack frame contains variables like you know maybe it's arc c and arc v or somewhere on here right these are all variables that are that are in scope relative to main when i call foo eventually what we'll go through is the process of the function foo creating a new stack frame that is now above main stack frame all these things here will belong to foo and be in local scope for foo so eventually foo will create this new stack frame and int x will be there and int y will be there these are all local variables to foo and then when it collapses the stack frame so that main stack frame is now the stack frame in scope okay so here we go the moment of truth on the left over here, we have the assembly instructions for the function foo, and on the right is gonna be my drawing of the creation of foo's stack frame. We're gonna walk through step-by-step step and explore how these instructions lead to more room being on the stack that are in scope to the function foo, right? It creates room for foo's variables. It can do things with those variables, and eventually we call the function prolog to collapse the stack and get rid of that room and get the stack back to the state that main had it in. So the first instruction we're gonna do is we're gonna push EBP. So right now BP points to the bottom of main stack frame. We need to preserve that so we can put it back to BP once this function is over. So here we're gonna push EBP. This is gonna be the old base pointer. Once we do that, we then move ESP into EBP. So that now makes the bottom of the stack equal to the current top of the stack. So now EBP 
points here. So now we have a new stack frame that is of height zero. So we're gonna get rid of this guy. This is no longer here. Both of these arrows point here, right? So we have EBP points here as well as ESP. We're then also going to push variables that we want to preserve across variable boundaries. So in this case, we also push EBX. It's gonna go on top of EBP. And then after that, we call that sub instruction. Sorry, I had to move my fat head to get out of the way. By subtracting hex 14 from ESP, we raise it and create more room on the stack for foo's local variables. So you can't see it here, but this new area here, this, this squirrely bracket is the room for foo's local variables. And in our code here before we had variables uh, X and Y, X and Y are gonna live locally here. And you can see that we actually move the D word pointer of one and two into these EBP relative locations, right? EBP minus 10, EBP minus C get one and two. That EBP minus 10 and the EBP minus C are the locations on the stack of X and Y. So before we talked about the function prologue, right? The area of the function that gets ran before the function even starts, that creates this stack frame for our function foo. And after this happens, foo runs, foo does its logic, maybe it calls other functions. But at the end of foo, we need to actually call foo's function epilogue. What that does is that collapses the stack frame back down so that main can then restore its stack frame to its original state. Now, all the instructions that happen are very simple here. There are three instructions. The first is that one that involves EBX. All that's happening here is it's moving the thing at EBP minus four, which is right here, EBX. It's the old EBX that we pushed and it's moving that into EBX. So it's essentially taking the saved value and putting it back into the register. This means that main depended on EBX not changing when it called foo. So it told us to push it onto the stack. We did that and now we're preserving it in the function epilogue. Now what we're doing is writing now, leave is a function in Intel assembly that actually does a bunch of implicit instructions. Intel assembly is basically an interpreted language. It can do a lot of stuff all at the same time. The leave instruction actually moves EBP into ESP. So now ESP no longer points here. ESP points to EBP. It's right here. It's in the same spot as EBP. And then when we call leave, not only do we subtract ESP and put it here, we also pop EBP, which means that the new base pointer is actually down here. So the state of the stack after this instruction gets ran is EBP points to the bottom and ESP points to almost the top. Now there is one more instruction that has to get ran. Now the last instruction we have to run is the return instruction. There is a magical value here on the stack that when main called foo, it got put onto the stack. Now the return instruction is a whole magical instruction. I made an entire other video about the return instruction because it's so complex in how functions call each other. Go watch that video and see if you can figure out what happens next.